Evening Committee on Government Operations Order. My name is Ryland Johnson. I'm the MLA for Yellowknife North and uh, chair of this committee. The, the Standing Committee of Government Operations is made up of regular members from several different constituencies. We are presently conducting a statutory review of the uh, Official Languages Act, which is a legal requirement as for the act to be reviewed every five years. Uh, committee, we actually began hosting public hearings last summer, and those are available on our Legislative Assembly pages. But we've had to delay on several occasions due to the COVID outbreaks. And with the most recent Omicron outbreak, committee decided it was best that we host the remaining public hearings virtually uh, in order to complete that review. We are always open to receiving further submissions or written submissions. So if anyone is watching this, please feel free to reach out if you want to give a presentation or if you want to provide a written submission, please do through our, through our clerk. Uh, the goal of this review is to seek uh, the public's opinion on how the Official Language Act could better promote and protect the territory's official languages. Uh, the public's feedback will help the committee make recommendations to the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment and to the government. Northwest Territories and how they deal with our official languages. And it is this committee's hope, along with the Minister Simpsons, that after many reviews and reports that uh, we will see some changes for the Official Languages Act in the life of this assembly. So I look forward to all of your submissions tonight. Thank you all for taking the time to present. Um, as is our custom, our first order of business is to open our meeting with a prayer. I will begin by leading us in prayer. We come here today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us engage in meaningful discussion. Allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of the community so that we may serve all the residents of the Northwest Territories. Amen. Now, we have had four registered speakers tonight. Uh, Ms. Linda Brodsky, the Executive Director of the Federation franco tenois Matisse Foisy, Paul Louchard, and Jessica Havel. Each uh, presenter will be allotted 20 minutes and there will be time for uh, questions from committee members. Uh, I will begin by asking committee members to introduce themselves and any opening comments they may have, uh, beginning with MLA Cleveland. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and bienvenue tout le monde. Um, I'm very, uh, I, I very much look forward to hearing what everybody has to say this evening. And I, I am very grateful that you have created space in your day for us to be able to listen to each of you. So thank you very much. And my name is Caitlin Cleveland and I am the MLA for Cam Lake. Uh, I'm Lisa Semler. I'm the MLA for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Um, as our chair has said, we've had one, um, one of these so far in my home community in Inuvik and due to COVID, we haven't been able to move forward with um, this. So I'm looking forward to the feedback that we'll be receiving tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emily Marcellos. Emily Marcellos, uh, the MLA for Tabacha. And I look forward to listening to the presentations tonight and um, Hopefully they'll have a, a lot to offer for our uh, our review on the Official Languages Act. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and lastly, Emily Olet. Uh, bonsoir, uh, je m'appelle Kevin O'Reilly. Je suis uh, uh, le député pour uh, Frame Lake. Uh, good evening, my name is Kevin O'Reilly. I'm the MLA for Frame Lake. Uh, uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining us this evening and I look forward to your comments. Merci. Thank you. Um, just as a matter of process, as this is a committee meeting, I will ask that all uh, questions and comments uh, go through the chair and uh, anyone will have to be wait to be directed uh, by the chair before speaking. Just a bit of a formality on our legislative process. Uh, but without further ado, I will turn it over to our first presenter, uh, very much about uh, those who are willing to speak to us tonight, Ms. Linda Bussey, the Executive Director of the Federation franco Uh Ms. Bussey, go ahead. Thank you, and I will be presenting in French, and I will <clears throat> try to talk very slowly. And I, so. um, Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. First of all, uh, I would like to recognize that we are in the land of the 
Okay. This is the uh, land of origin. We respect the historic uh, and we, we respect the historical land of First Nations, Métis, and the peoples of Canada. Its existence continues to enrich the life of our communities. As a director of the Franco Tenois, I am happy to be here tonight, but I would also like to talk about our aspiration, about the aspirations of the linguistic community of Franco Tenois. The community represents, is represented by the FTT. It is it prones the perseverance, the inclusion, continuity, collaboration, and most of all, this feeling of belonging in a linguistic part of this uh, uh, territory. We are part of this community and we want to reinforce Francophony here and make sure that we are part of the linguistic community that are part of the Northwest Territory and are part of its rich diversity. Mr. Speaker, we are at a, a, moment, a turning point in history. The linguistic issues are large for the French communities, but also for the other minority languages in the territory. The context of the law has been evolving since the creation, and it's important to make an update by building on its foundation. The current law give French and English equal privilege. Also, the goal is to give all linguistic uh, languages uh, a way to participate in, at the government and public institutions. It is important to give opportunities. So these are the orientation and obligations that will be maintained on the new law on official language. And this will offer up the necessary opportunities to bring forward the vitality of the language communities. The latest law will reinforce the current law with concrete measures that are verifiable beyond the adoptions uh, that has been done in 1988. And, and we want to avoid decline we need a new law. As described by a study in 2002, we are a territory with many voices. Many voices want to reinforce the minority, uh, the several communities, I should say. We must go beyond assuring their survival. They must flourish. We have to understand there is the federal law on the territory, and we must have to work with a compromise which is social and political. The latest law must go beyond recommendations and advice. It must have concrete measures. It is now time to have concrete measures that will lead the communities into the next phase of to be to be able to move forward by integrating the language of uh, official languages not only in the public institutions but also in everyday life of our of the people the, what people who have a minority language want is to live in their own language in order to transmit it to the future the supreme court of canada has said that language rights must be interpreted in function of their object and it has to be maintained by helping flourish communities in Canada. May they be a linguistic laws in Canada, not, also these, lingu these linguistic territorial languages are part of the protection of the minority languages of the Northwest Territories. These are the measures that we want to put forward. To put an obligation to the state, make sure that there is an imputability to protect the linguistic community. The Supreme Court of Canada recognized that the, uh, the equality is a norm in Canadian law. 
and their linguistic right need governmental measures and we must create obligations for the state. And these obligations can be part of a minimal services. They can be in terms of uh, hiring. It can be con contained in the programs and services. We must reinforce the role of the uh, Commissary on Official Languages. The communities of the Northwest Territories need a law that has a strong grip and recommendations, uh, we must go beyond it and we need to have a calendar. We must and we need to have a better grip. If not, there will, not be, there will be no change and no enhancement. Just like the Commissioner on Access of Information, the same powers, which is constrain the witness, the documents, and we must have constrained ordinance to the Commissary on Official Languages. We must give also uh, to the office to uh, do its mandate. Give, let, let's give credit where credit is due. There has been some progress since uh, 1988. But let's not forget that some progress when it comes to French education or the offers, this is something that has been given through uh, court, the court. So we must have a political. The power to constrain is necessary in order to make the law real. The more the law gives uh, leverage, the least the tribunals will be necessary. The new law must uh, be able to be strong in order to make sure that the people who are a part of their community flourish. And it also should have internal mechanism in order to solve the problems. This way, we will not need to go to court. We must also have some report with clear indicators to uh, see the language portrait in the territory, because we cannot judge what we cannot see. We must understand the context in which we evolve. We must have clear indicators. We must have clear objectives. In order to make a report, this way we'll be able to see what the progress is. And we will be able to make the corrections. The linguistic uh, could be done by the linguistic committee. And this will be the base to give recommendation to a public organization. And this is a power that should be also added on the legislation of official languages. And this indicator could be statistics. It could be the number of employees. It could be uh, who is functional uh, in a language other than in English, other than English, uh, the number of positions that require bilingual services. It could be the existence of operational in French. It could be internal politics. It could, or it could be the number of percentage of the people who speak the French language. We have to mobilize the public sector. We must enhance uh, competency, linguistic competency. And we have to give opportunities to those who speak another language in English. It doesn't mean that we don't um, want people who are higher on the merit, but it means that the future employees that can give uh, services in language other than English may, give a, may be given opportunities. And we must understand uh, that this is something that enhances our services. Finally, the FFT, wants to recognize the progress that has been done. That being said, there's a lot of work still to be done in order to meet the objectives. The sectors that we must prioritize for the future are in health, education, uh, childcare, and justice. We have to go beyond hello and bonjour. Equality is much more than just saying a few words. 
we must be integrated in uh, the workplace. The FFT wants to give its support to the communities of the Northwest Territory and any initiative that will bring a real revitalization of indigenous language will also be celebrated. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for uh, having the privilege of expressing myself today. The communities must be part of the process in order to change the law. We are aware, we, are, we know that you will uh, invite us again to discuss furthermore. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Wesley. Uh, your comments are greatly appreciated by committee. And it, it appears, uh, if you have any speaking notes that you could share with committee, I'm sure uh, our clerk who is taking notes would, would greatly appreciate that. Uh, I will share them. I, I just need up. to fix them a little bit. <laughs> I made some changes on the way here, so I'll, I'll do that. Thank you so much. Uh, and Thank I you again for the opportunity. Any, I'll open the floor to any questions from committee. Emily Cleveland, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and merci à Madame Bussy. Um, I I wanted to start off by by thanking um, Ms. Bussy for also acknowledging minority languages throughout the Northwest Territories in her presentation. I think that it's important that um, throughout this conversation that that we reflect on how uh, a lot of the successes seen in the French community can also be seen in, in Indigenous speaking uh, communities with across the Northwest Territories and Indigenous languages. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Madame Bassi for pointing out um, the, the sectors of the GNWT and the departments that would see the greatest potential uh, success by having um, that access to, to language being health, education, child care and justice. I, I think that's very strong because one of the things that we run into is um, as a question is where where does this change and evolution start? Where is it strongest? And, and so I really appreciate that. My question for Madame Bassi is in regards to active offer, which is what the GNWT uses a lot right now. And I'm wondering um, how Madame Bassi sees the evolution of active offer into a much more, uh, a much stronger government with all of its languages. And so where does this go? Does it become everything that is put out in English is automatically becomes put out in each language? And so I'm wondering if Ms. Bussey can speak a little bit more to what the evolution of that active offer becomes. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Bussey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I never know if in English it's Miss or Mrs. Cleveland, but <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for the question and for the comments. Uh, I think the there is an evolution with the L'Affractive. I think now, uh, and we're already, we work a lot with health, with uh, the, uh, I mean, that's the one of the departments that is the most a priority for us because we all know that health is a priority for everyone and being able to speak in your language uh, any language is a priority to be understood. Um, I think there's more training to be done. And as I said in my, I think we have to go beyond the hello, bonjour, and we need to be able to offer more services. Um, and, and, I, it's, and I think one of the things I don't talk about in my, uh, this presentation, but in, in the written document is um, there's one um, place that needs a lot of amelioration is uh, amelioration or improvement, sorry, is uh, the time, the delay, uh, if you have a service in a different language, if by the time you get your service, there's a delay often that can be detrimental to some people, especially in the healthcare. So I think there's a, it's a growing ev evolution. I don't think every position should be bilingual in any, I mean, I don't think we can do that in any of the 11 languages, but I think we need to be more aware that if we have bilingual positions, they have to be bilingual positions and they have to be more than, and, and, I, and we say not just in French, but in every language, and there needs to be dedicated positions. You know, as, um, as a past experience, as the manager of the interpreter service at Stanton, I saw the importance of having um, immediate services available in every language. And I mean, it's one of the places that it's important. And 
and you're you're you know you're dealing with people's livelihood so it's a key uh, and I think uh, but I think there needs to be I think there needs to be more dedicated bilingual positions and when I say bilingual more than hello bonjour yeah I hope that answered your question thank you very much are there any further questions from the committee go ahead Emily O'Reilly uh, merci, et merci, Linda, uh, for your presentation. Um, you talked a little bit about how the um, you want to see, I guess, the uh, official languages commissioner to have uh, um, more authority, uh, maybe akin to what the uh, information and privacy commissioner has in terms of uh, order making authority um, to kind of order that things be done. Um, can you just talk maybe a little bit more about what kind of authority you think the languages commissioner should have? Thanks, merci. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Um, I, I can certainly not exactly tell you right now what a, the, the um, what would be uh, her authority, but if you look at other uh, like privacy. I mean, right now, the language commissioner is only in receipt of complaints where she can, she or he, depending on the position, can never act on, can never follow. I mean, they can make some recommendation, but there's nothing in place to make a change, a direct change, as, and to make recommendations to the department to make a change or to, uh, it can be not even just the department, it can be more than that or to a uh, um, arm's length or, but there's nothing in place right now that where, she, where he or she could have a strong mandate to come forward and make a recommendation and follow up on those recommendations. The only, there's no power at all. I mean, the language commissioner comes to the assembly once a year, makes, uh, presents a, a report and some documents. Uh, and we all know that how busy everybody is. So often those recommendations are, they're just, they're not, they can't be imposed. They're not followed through. So what we want is a system where if there is a breach, well, they, it can be followed up and, you know, it needs to be, everybody needs to be accountable. I think if the commissioner has more of a power, there's going to be more accountability on the different, on the government and on the different organizations that are tied by the uh, language. Does that answer your question? Okay, <laughs> thank you. You got the thumbs up from Emily already. Any uh, further questions from the committee? Uh, seeing none, uh, Ms. Fussy, thank you very much for your presentation. It's, it's greatly appreciated. And uh, I am hoping that we will be having further conversations when we have some recommendations and proposed changes to the act to move forward. So Looking forward. I, uh, to it. <laughs> thank you very much for the opportunity right. once, once again. again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our, our next presenter tonight is Ms. Fozzi. Uh, Baptiste, I will turn the floor over to you. Go ahead. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Bonsoir. Uh, je n'étais pas certain s'il allait avoir interprétation ce soir. Alors, j'ai préparé mes notes en anglais pour le comité. Alors, je pense que je vais faire ma présentation essentiellement en anglais. Je vais peut-être changer d'un quelques moments. Et, et, et j'aimerais aussi, je, je, je me demande seulement si... Le, if, uh, si le membre de Tebacha uh, qui, re, qui se joint uh, à la conversation à ta téléphone a accès à l'interprétation. Uh, yeah, hold on one second. Right now, both your French audio and the English uh, interpretation is coming through the same time on my speakers. So I just want to make sure our technical staff have. Uh, time there. So the interpretation was happening, but uh, can, uh, Baptiste, can I perhaps get you to just start again there? And I believe the interpretation should come through now simultaneously. And just a reminder to speak slow for our interpreters. Comme, comme je le disais, je vais essentiellement okay, faire so ma présentation was, en anglais uh, parce saying, que mes notes sont en anglais. Be speaking in English. My notes are in English. Um, so uh, I'm here tonight uh, because, and I'm actually joining from Montreal, Quebec, because I'm actually completing an undergraduate uh, degree in translation. Uh, 
uh, currently. Uh, and unfortunately, you can't do that in the Northwest Territories. It has to be somewhere else. I'm in Montreal. Um, before uh, the studying for translation, I worked for 15 years, uh, over 15 years, in fact, as a journalist in the North. And one of the topics that I've re extensively covered and researched is official languages issues. Um, and because of that, I have a rather, I would say humbly, uh, rather extensive knowledge of the act and uh, its implementation or lack thereof. Um, and I've been following, of course, with great interest, the work of the standing committee uh, and also previous standing committees who've also um, looked at the act before. And um, I've also had the privilege through my work to discuss some of the key issues surrounding the Languages Act with a wide array of language stakeholders across the territory. Um, and it's from that standpoint that I felt that I kind of had a citizen duty to address the standing committee on this particular issue, uh, because I feel uh, I might have, have some key information to share with you. Um, just to start, I'd like to mention that every day, multiple times a day, the GNWT finds itself in blatant violation of its Languages Act. It's been almost 40 years that we've had this uh, legislation or uh, in different form. And uh, the institutional contempt of the Languages Act remains, I must say, systemic. Uh, we're having these discussions, uh, as we're having the discussion, every NWT official languages other than English is uh, in a state of statistical assimilation. Legislation alone will not redress the dire situation, but it remains the fundamental tool to attain our revitalization objectives, I believe. Uh, the intent of the GNWT to reopen the act, we've seen that the GNWT has announced uh, to this committee uh, last year that it will be presenting a few uh, changes, cosmetic changes, I would say, to the act. Uh, well, it offers this rare opportunity to make the bold and necessary changes to the legislation to expand the rights of official language speakers, to reform and specify the roles of public linguistic institutions, and to establish a legal framework for the revitalizations of our languages. Uh, it's my hope that this committee will, uh, and, I, and I'm very confident that this committee will dare propose uh, such changes and to make landmark contribution to in uh, the Renaissance Cultural of uh, the Northwest Territories. Uh, the main issues that I will to, uh, want to address today are the systematic, systemic lack of implementation of the current act, um, what we call the federal model, uh, and also uh, uh, the, the tendency that we have for Northern exceptionalism, uh, the need to reform key institutions as defined in the act and expand uh, languages rights. I'll start with uh, lack of implementation. Basically, uh, in at the current at the current moment, every time a Northwest Territory resident interacts with their government, uh, if you are by the book, you would say that the act is being violated. Uh, there, uh, I believe it was in uh, November of 2020 that the member for Inuvik Twin Lake uh, made these remarks in the in uh, the chamber. Uh, about the implementation of uh, what we call the active offer protocols uh, at the Inovic Hospital. And they made the remark that uh, front, de front desk staff there felt like they couldn't greet the public in Gwich'in or Inuvialuktun. Uh, if that is true, then that is certainly a great violation of the act. Uh, in my interpretation of what the act says, um, in fact, these civil servants have a responsibility to always greet the public in uh, these languages, as well as French and English, and then to offer the service in the preferred language of the clientele. Obviously, if the staff feels that they are not allowed to do that, that shows how systemic the problem is with the implementation of the act. Uh, we've seen other examples. I could go on all night about them at the COVID vaccination clinic you could get a button in uh, your official language of preference, but you couldn't get any explanation about uh, the vaccine you were about to get in your language other than English. Uh, at isolation centers, I myself had to sign documents 
uh, that were only provided to me in English that were binding me legally to stay put at uh, the isolation center. Um, and those documents could only be available in English. Um, if you try to book a same day appointment with HSSA any given day, uh, you get to you get to call there, and when you pick up the phone, they tell you, "Well, pour le service en français, faites le deux." So you dial two for French, but if you do that, what happens is you get screened out, and uh, you uh, and you get screened out. You end up on some voicemail, and of course, you have to speak with someone to get uh, an appointment. So choosing French actually directs you away from your service. That's the situation we're in uh, right now. And those are only a few uh, examples. We've seen also uh, um, in um, January of last year when there was an outbreak in Fort Liard uh, of the COVID-19, uh, we've realized the information needed to be shared rapidly with the community. And it was first only shared in English. And now we realized, oh, and, and at that time, uh, we managed, the government managed to rapidly get the, the, the messages translated in Denis Atier and, and to get them aired on the radio as well, which is great. But it showed us that these rights that are in the act, they're not simply uh, a fancy they actually are there because they are needed and people need to have access to their information in the official language of their preference. Um, <clears throat> we need, there is a need for a framework that would more clearly define the obligation of the states towards the official languages uh, speakers and perhaps something that can be worked out in the bylaws uh, rather than in the legislation. I'm not the legislator there, but certainly the GNWT needs to understand that uh, languages <laughs> needs to be language services need to be offered. Um, it it's not it's, it can, cannot be a second thought. It needs to be um, in the in the the pipeline from the get go. Uh, we may also need to have consequences for the violations in the act or incentives for the government to respect the legislation. Um, there's been a lot that's been said about uh, how we need to move away from a federal model that this legislation uh, would be stemming from and to create uh, made in the North uh, legislation. Um, I, I would like to address, say a couple of things about that. The federal official languages legislation and the NWT Official Languages Act, they've evolved from a common ground, that is true, but they're already quite different. Uh, we have 11 official languages. And um, they are also bound to evolve in separate ways. Our legislation was amended in the early 2000s. The federal legislation is undergoing changes of its own as we speak. So the idea that we're just copying the federal model, it's not really the truth. That's kind of like something that is out there, but it doesn't really reflect what is in our act. It's always a good political father to uh, blame the feds. Uh, or to ask for made in the North policies, what I call the Northern exceptionalism. However, um, if having a legislation that's tailored to Northern needs is important, of course, uh, that should not be an excuse to get a subpar legislation either. We need to be open to look at other jurisdiction best practices and to adapt them to our reality when it makes sense to do so. To say that we need to move away from the federal model, it can mean many things. It's simply a convenient rhetoric formula. It's not a benchmark of quality. Uh, if by moving away from the federal model, what we mean is like the languages commissioner once proposed is to get rid of such concepts as significant demand or nature of the office to make official languages uh, services universal across a the territory, then that's great, perfect. I love that. But if it means like the SCOGO uh, committee suggested in 2008 to trash the OLA and to replace it with a limited list of services that the government must provide in some languages, then that would be a step backward. And that wouldn't be acceptable in my opinion. Um, I do not remember precisely what the services that were listed in the 2008 SCOGO proposal, but I'm confident that uh, pandemic lockdowns were not considered then. 
there's a need to reform key institutions that are defined in the act. Um, I'll start with the languages board. Uh, the, well, I mean, it's actually the proposal of the GNWT to change that part of the act. They want to amalgamate the boards. There are two boards right now. Uh, basically, it's already done. It's just not done in the act. Uh, well, uh, I think we also probably should need to look at redefining the role, uh, the uh, purpose of this board. Uh, there is no transparency of the board at the moment. They don't print annual report, reports. We don't really know what is being talked to at those meetings. Uh, official language speakers, uh, by and large, don't even know who represent them on these boards or what they're doing. So there needs to be a clarification, I believe, of the nomination process. Um, it's, and also in the last few years, uh, the board, my understanding is, has been more or less organized by the Indigenous Languages Secretariat. Uh, they seem to be calling the meetings to set the agendas. That, in my view, uh, calls in question the independence of this advisory body. If we're going to amend the act or to amalgamate the boards, then we also should look at um, how we can better create a better framework of the board to make sure that, and also to make sure that they have the resources to properly, properly do their uh, important work. The another in, uh, institution that is defined in the act is the languages commissioner office. Um, there's are other similar positions, uh, public offices that we have dedicated legislations for that really defines what their functions are. I'm thinking about uh, the ombuds uh, legislation that uh, has been passed uh, in the the recent years. Um, the OLC uh, is minimally defined in the act currently. I think we could use a detailed legislation dedicated solely to the languages commissioner function. Uh, this office is only relevant when uh, they indeed conduct the investigation and point out the breaches uh, in the act. The office has the power to launch an investigation of its own initiative, but they don't really do that so much. Uh, last time I've seen uh, an investigation like that uh, was in the year 2000 about ELT. It hasn't been done since. Um, and since there's so little formal complaints to the, uh, the commissioner, it seems baffling to me that we don't see more of those uh, self-guided, uh, self-initiated uh, investigations. Uh, maybe we need a framework to so that the, uh, the, the commissioner feels that they have the leeway to conduct these investigations. The OLC should always have at least one investigation on the go. In the, in the, when we see how the GNWT is like in perpetual contempt of the act, uh, we could expect that the annual reports would be brimming with examples of breaches of the act. But clearly, that's not what is currently happening. And maybe a legis uh, to better explain the role of the commissioner would help uh, in this fashion. The language commissioner office, it's an important tool to protect the rights of official language speakers. But years of underperformance have severely eroded its credibility. It needs the resources that are necessary to really do their job. Um, I concur with the successive commissioners that the GNWD must respond to their recommendation. Uh, they, they need to, uh, complying with the act, uh, when you're caught not doing so, it shouldn't be optional. Like there needs to be consequences <laughs> again. If there's a breach, we need to have a mechanism in place to make sure that uh, we deal with them. Um, and uh, maybe uh, an opportunity for in that regard would be to set up the office as an administrative tribunal like we have for human rights legislation. That would definitely uh, bring the teeth that are uh, lacking currently in the act. Uh, then there's another, there's other offices that are not defined in the act. I'm talking about the languages secretariats. They did not exist when we amended the act in 2003. Basically, uh, they've been picking up the slacks that were created by when the promotion and revitalization mandates were taken off the plate of the languages commissioner. Um, a renewed legislation, in my opinion, should define the role and duties of these newly formed public bodies. And now uh, I'd like to take a 
some time to just talk about the expansions of languages rights. Um, one thing is as the, we could do is as the language commissioner uh, once proposed, maybe we can take out the significant demand concept and the nature of the office concept from the act to make sure that uh, the duties of the GNWT when it comes to uh, languages and official languages, well, they are paramount throughout the territory. Uh, they are universal. We don't have to, to wonder, is this office uh, covered by the act? All the offices should be covered and all languages should be covered by the act. This, and that would be a way to uh, move away from the federal model. Um, we should include languages as a protected ground under the Human Rights Act. Uh, they're not a human right, a protected ground right now. Uh, and I can tell you that discrimination on the basis of language is a real issue. It happens for sure. I, in my career as a journalist, I've investigated instances where uh, employees of the GNWT, for instance, were being discriminated on the basis of their language. Um, but they couldn't uh, resort to human rights legislation because that's not a protected ground. Maybe that's something we should look at. Um, also, and I think that's something that has been brought by, uh, uh, that has been put forward by this committee, by the chair of the committee, uh, that maybe we need a right to education in indigenous languages. Um, I'm not an indigenous language speaker. It's not for me to decide that. But as a person who actually has similar rights for, <laughs> as a, um, a federal, federally legislated minority <laughs> speaker, language speaker, uh, I think having those rights is really uh, is really a big uh, is really important for to the preservation of a language. Um, there are other jurisdictions that have successfully done it that they created those rights for indigenous speakers in, in other jurisdictions. We could look at those jurisdictions for guidance or as examples. Those jurisdictions are, well, the first we did it was Quebec. That's part of the La Charte de la Langue Française, a uh, bill uh, colloquially known as Bill 101. Uh, uh, but uh, the people, uh, the, the, the place where they really did it, and they did it starting from our legislation, actually, so that's really an example that we should look at, is Nunavut uh, created a separate legislation for uh, the revitalization of um, Inuit language. And so what they did in those, in those uh, jurisdictions is rather than amending the Languages Act, they created separate pieces of legislation that cover the need, the, those needs. Uh, right now, there is um, the Education Act is also undergoing review. Perhaps that would be an appropriate vessel to enshrine such rights. Of course, uh, such changes must be agreed upon by the indigenous linguistic communities themselves. Uh, if the assembly is going to amend the Languages Act, then they probably have a duty to ask the linguistic communities if uh, they would like to have those kind of rights. To my knowledge, in all the successive consultations and forums on languages that we've had over the years, uh, it's never been asked. So maybe that the time is ripe to ask, go ask them these questions. Do they want a right to education in their language? Um, and again, uh, we could also touch on the legislation on revitalization. Again, there's other jurisdictions that have done it, Quebec and Nunavut, especially Nunavut as a piece of legislation that, uh, you know, says this is uh, the, we have goals to hire uh, a public service that can speak the language. Uh, maybe we can look at how Nunavut's done it and see how we can come up with a model that is satisfying for the Northwest Territories. Um, that was a lot of material crammed in a little bit of time. I thank you, Mr. Chair, for, and the Standing Committee for your attention and to give me the opportunity to express myself on this topic that I'm passionate about. Uh, it's one of, in those moments that I feel blessed to be a citizen of the Northwest Territories. Kwani Masicho, un grand merci tout le monde. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Fozzi, for your presentation and I, your depth of knowledge and all of your advocacy over, over many assemblies on this issue. It, it, it's greatly appreciated by committee.
Uh, I'll open the floor to any questions from many members. Emily Cleveland, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, merci, Mr. Foisy, for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Um, Foisy, for your presentation. I'm really happy that you brought up none of its legislation. Um, the, the Inuit Languages Protection Act is where I wanted to ask my question of you this evening. Uh, there, the Inuit Language Protection Act from Nunavut um, does have a section that specifies um, the duties of organizations within Nunavut, and it, so it expands to both employers um, outside of the GNWT, and I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, the appropriateness of a GNWT legislation that really sets up a foundation of language expectations outside of the government as well. Thank you. Monsieur le Président, euh, question. alors, euh, so I'm, I'm not like an expert at, in any ways of the Nunavut legislation. So, I don't, and I'm, 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 my, my knowledge of these issues stems basically from being on the ground. And I, I don't want to give out any uh, views that I'm some sort of expert on this legislation, but uh, absolutely, I would concur that the model that is put forward by Nunavut uh, would be applicable probably uh, in large extent to the situation in the Northwest Territories. Again, there's, uh, there's huge differences between our legislations uh, in the sense, or in our context. Nunavut has four official languages um, or three, depending on you want to count it. We have 11. Um, so it, I mean, it's, it, it would be much easier to only have one language if you were just an administrator, right? But uh, the, the, the goal here being that we provide uh, citizens with services, um, you need to look at like what is actually doable uh, in the situation not all the languages are in the same situation. Like the Klechon language is in a much better position, say, than the Gwich'in language currently. Uh, there would it's easy, probably easier to find the the resources to provide the services for uh, the Klechon language uh, rather than the Gwich'in language. That being said, uh, the 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 objective of of a legislation is to set like an expectation. Obviously, uh, I mean, if you look at in Ottawa or the federal government right now, they're not meeting the their languages act, but the, the act is there so that the, the communities have a tool to, uh, to say, hey, we got rights. So if I would encourage the community to set up the right to, don't limit yourself to what can be done. Write the legislation for what you, we would love to, we would hope to see. So then that the communities have this tool that they can um, bring about to uh, make those changes happen in the realm of reality. Uh, obviously, we're not going to find uh, uh, teachers to teach uh, to teach all 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 topics at, in all of our schools in 11 languages, that's not going to happen tomorrow, but it could be a goal that we set ourselves as an ideal in the legislation. Thank you very much, Mr. Foggy. Are there any further questions from the committee? Emily Semler, go ahead, the line as well. Yes, and thank you for your um, presentation um, to the committee. And I know that you did address um, the the act of offer in in the hospital in Inuvik. And I know at the time that was being introduced, I was actually a, a hiring like a manager within the, the hospital. And you know, one of the things that happened during the time of training everybody to do the act of offer was almost the like it, I guess in the you know, in the way that the French were fighting for years ago to make sure that French is, a, is an official language. You know, you have the indigenous people, like you said, that were feeling like they were being forced to have to say it, say the act of offer whenever they answered. And then they were told we're doing audits and, you know, and then it was just like this, 
it was almost and then you have indigenous people answering the phones and they're being like well they don't put this much effort on us to be able to provide services and the other thing that I found when I was working with the helpless that we had a list of translators but they weren't actually people that were hired they're just like people that we know and that we usually call if we you know and it's kind of like this off the side of the desk on the nursing desk that if we have somebody who can't speak this well these are the people that could possibly come in and help you know and I don't think we've taken like you said that the emphasis and 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 when we did the hearing here I liked what you said about there there's nothing we're not forcing the government's hand at changing this and if if we're like we're losing like the Gwich'in and the Inuvialuit language for instance like you said the Klicho and there's some other languages that are a lot stronger this the languages in my region we're losing them we're losing speakers that as they as our elders are passing away that percentage of what we can the people that can speak is going and going and going um how do you and I know some of the people that presented it's it was that force of being able to have the people that can speak teach it in in and supported in teaching it and you said it and it can be changed in the education act but how do you feel like and maybe you can answer this or recommend to us since um you seem to have a lot of knowledge in this area to the official language act that we can force the hand of ECNE to make sure that they provide education, like you know, and I think that's the that's that's the key where we need to we need to move it from one person to the next person, and if we don't be providing those classes, we're never going to revive it or even save it. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Yes, Mr. President, uh, it's a very uh, impor important question that you've been asking. What I would like to say is that the, the way it's written right now, the Official Languages Act, it's basically not the place to enshrine those kind of education rights because the Languages Act is essentially a piece of legislation that pertains to public service. To and that's why I'm saying, well, we look at what other jurisdictions did, particularly Nunavut, uh, is, yeah, they amended our act. They started with our act. They amended it. Basically, they took off the languages that they didn't have in the act. They kept everything else very much the same. Oh, yeah, and they, they also made sure that in Octetut language, rather than being like offered in specific regions, was, uh, all, uh, was uh, across territory in their case. Uh, and then they created a separate act that they called the, the Promotion and Revitalization Act, I believe. I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm not a specialist of the, of the law, but I'm also thinking that it could possibly be part of the Education Act. There's just no, a, there's an opportunity there because the act is being review, is reviewed at the moment is why I'm bringing this mm -hmm. there. And then what they did is they said, well, Education in the Inuktitut language, and it could be in the Inuvialuktun language, it could be in the Gwich'in language, it could be in 11 languages, that this is a right, that you have a right to go to school and be taught in your language. That being said, that doesn't mean that it's what's happening. I mean, and we've got NTI currently uh, that is treating or have, ish, um, have been treating to sue the, the government of Nunavut. And I think they might have actually is, uh, initiated such uh, legal actions because that's what, the, that's what you as legislator can do is to create those benchmark those like uh, these these uh, these expectations but then the government usually <laughs> the way it, it's been going on in canada anyways for in languages right is like once the right are there then the speakers 
must uh, assert the rights and it usually goes through the court system. Uh, obviously, it seems uh, when you have a small group like uh, for the Inuvialuit language, uh, the Inuvialuit language or the Wichita language, and most of the speakers are elders, um, that passion to uh, take it to court might not be there. Uh, it might be harder. And that's where I believe possibly uh, band consoles or the IRC in the case of the Inuvialuit uh, language, um, have a role to to play to uh, to as the government to uh, uphold their with the with the access. Right now, we don't have such an act, so it's not happening. That's how the French got their schools. You know? We we started by having a law, and then the French said we want to have our schools, and the government GNWT wasn't getting was not going to just award these schools. It took the it, it it took judges and court orders to get the schools. Now, once you have a court order that says you have a right to a, a school. You also need the teachers <laughs> in those schools. So I mean, we, there is no time to be wasted. Like that's it's, it's so procedural. But the truth is, uh, the people that can teach the language, they can pass on the language. They're old already. Uh, it needs to be done right away. And I certainly hope that if there was such a right, if there was such a legislation. Uh, that there would be political will to make it happen and that we don't have to suffer the old court process system. Unfortunately, if you look at the history of how it's been done, it's usually how it happens. Right now in Nunavut, they have the legislation. They don't quite have the schools and the teachers yet. They're taking it to court. Thank you very much, Mr. Poisy, uh, for your answers. That, that is very... Uh on the point of what we're dealing with. Uh, are there any further questions from committee? Seeing none, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation and I hope that we will have continued conversations in this area as committee moves forward to hopefully getting some changes to the act and our recommendations for how the official languages act can move forward. Uh, our next presenters are uh, Mr. Paul Boucher and Jessica Ravon, I will turn the line over to you. Atlantic era, salute. Official alike with Aka Yastiha. Paul Ushe Huliane, Tapachada Master, PWK Reclis Quena Yoga Alanada, Dena Yati Hono Tanatida. So Anada, Mayor Rose Boucher, Ni Hulia, Seta Henry King Ni Hulia, Deschat Ida Heslika Hasti. Sedekwi hati hasi netzi de denagocho. Nana zira hilu i denagajani sana. Do lazi napa horilia ha horil zai. Ath nether shu harliu hasi besuti. Taga hasi gorlia si dena hanulta. I speak to you in my language first to let you know how important my language is to me and my family and my nations. Also to let you know that we're on our traditional territory first. Protecti Denetet Linayati. Some of you may know it as Denesus Linayati, but my people have called it Denetet Lina. And other indigenous languages in the North must be a priority and recognized to the full extent. We must raise the profile of the language in government, in partners, and our communities. Our language must be visible so our people and children can see the language everywhere. Right now, that's not the case. 
departments have to be mandated for the community indigenous language to be visible in their offices. When I take students to these different offices, in different departments in Fort Smith, the department tell me it's only optional that we, we uh, advertise the indigenous language. I think that's wrong. Because as a teacher, I wanna bring my students out to these places so they can see the language. Right now, they don't see it. Right now, you go to the health center, the language is everywhere in there. Beautiful place to go to, to show the kids that this is where our language is. Education has also done that. But we need other departments to show the language so that it's visible. Right now, it's not. With our, within our act, we know that we recognize all these languages, but what are we doing? For example, what I call the different departments right now because of COVID, you always have to press buttons. That's all I hear is French and English, but I don't have an option for Denet et Lina or Cree or Tlicho or Guchin. I think there should be those options there on our telephones, what we phone, any department or any government organization. I think that's important because I want the kids that I have that I'm teaching to know that, that the government is, is supporting them in learning the language. Government must advocate. This is an idea that I got from the Muscatchies down in Alberta, was that we need to look at a declaration to de be developed by our communities, recognizing the community indigenous languages as official languages also of the community. So that will, that'll be a springboard of seeing the language again, very visible in our community. Right now at Fort Smith, we have it on our, on, on some of our, uh, our um, signs. We have it on our stop sign. I wanna see more of it because it's important for the kids to see the language. As part of reconciliation and the implementation of uh, the uh, United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, that needs to be also somehow put into this, uh, this act. It has to be recognized since the government has recognized that now, they need to start to put that into their legislation. And how do we could implement that? Also, indigenous rights to language must be implemented. It must be at the forefront, like I said, must be there. Right now it's not. This legislation that we have in front of us, this official language act, it's like a token. It's like a wooden Indian in the window. I think we have to take that wooden Indian out of the window and recognize the indigenous people when they speak their language a lot more in, in that legislation. Because when I look at it, I see before the, um, the roles and responsibility of the Indigenous Language Revitalization Board was just to review, to advise. And I think that's, that's not, that's not something where we want to go. I think there's, I think we need to raise that a lot, a lot more. I'm a very strong advocate of Indigenous language in the communities to make the language part of the community. I teach our youth at high school and need as much support as possible from all sections of the North to ensure we promote, preserve, protect our languages. For our languages to survive, we need everyone on board. The Official Language Act should not be, a, like I said, a token, but a living document, a live document, where it has some flexibility 
in terms of what we can do. Right now, it doesn't because it's just advise, advise, advise. It doesn't give ownership. It doesn't give you know, an opportunity for communities and departments to, to, uh, to be creative. I think that's important. And that will help and protect our languages because then we can give people some creativity. Because if we keep saying advise and review, advise and review, I don't think that's the right, right way to go. The elders have always said that we have to coexist. How do we coexist? That's the question they always ask. How do we coexist together? Is we've got to walk together like brothers. I'm indigenous. I don't see much indigenous people at this table right now. Just Miss, Miss Martha Sallows and uh, my colleague here, Jess. And to be, to be frank, you know, we need to pass on our knowledge, like my parents said. We need to pass that knowledge down to our young people. Everyone should have access to learning or reconnecting with the language. Let's coexist in the spirit and intent of a relationship laid out by our ancestors. It's there already. It's just a matter of us now looking at that and creating that coexistence. Because I don't want to be a token Indian. I want to be part of, uh, of, of growing the language, part of a community. That's what I like to see. Tahuna, live long. Any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Boucher, for your, your presentation and all of the work that you do to preserve your language. I uh, will open the floor up to any questions from committee. Here I will. Uh... Go ahead, Emily Martins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Paul, uh, Mr. Boucher, I think that uh, we've had uh, some discussions about uh, promotion of Indigenous languages. And, uh, you know, I've always tried to be very inclusive of all groups, just like you. And uh, I know that you want to be part of change. Um, I never looked at the public uh, hearing on Official Languages Act as a token, but uh, now that you have brought that to my attention. I will make sure that when we have a when we have the when we have the minister in front of us, I will ask those same questions that you've asked and you have brought to the table. I think that um, until uh, the official languages are on par with the uh, official languages of Canada, which is um, French and English, and until we have the same um, the same monies to advance our languages and to have the programming in place. Um, we don't have any schools. Uh, we don't have all these other things, and those are lacking. And um, I, I really appreciate your comments because you are, you are reconciling with everybody that's that around the table. And... Um, and being more creative, and uh, you know, uh, you 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 said some really incredible things about reconciliation and UNDRIP and implementation of Indigenous languages. And I wonder how you feel. Do you feel that you are? I know that you uh, do incredible work at the high school, um, and uh, I'm just wondering on your ideas of how you can. Like, do you get in, like, do you think that the indigenous languages get the same amounts of money as the uh, uh, the two main official languages of Canada? Well, that's my question, I guess. Uh, there. I think we're well, always I think we're we're always struggling to find funding all the time, and and we're always creative in finding different pots of funding that would support. Our, our initiatives in, in promoting the language and also, also promoting our culture. So we always find, we're always being creative every year. We come in and we say, okay, what can we do to, 
to promote our language or bring the bar higher so that our kids can learn the language. And I always say that sometimes legislation stops that. And uh, we need to somehow you know, look at those and say, how can how we raise that profile of our language? Is by you know, funding it properly, by uh, making sure that the legislation is flexible so that we can grow with it. That's why I always say it's a living document. You know, the elders always said, you know, our, our treaty is a living, is living. They always said that to me. And I believe that. So when, when we look at documentation like this, you know, we, we have to make it where it's working for us. We can shift it within. We can, you know, we can't make it so, so uh, rigid. We got to be very flexible. So, you know, to do that, and we do need that funding in place to, to, uh, to be successful. And money always helps. But also, I think being, uh, having people in the right places will help also. Even though I never met any of you before, but I'm glad that you could listen to what I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Boucher, for your comments. Any further questions from the committee? Emily Cleveland, go ahead. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate it. And Masi, Mr. Boucher, for your presentation this evening. Um, one of, I, I have two questions, but my first one is um, more in the sense of um, access to language or, or to services and programs in Indigenous languages. and. In talking to people from different departments, I find one of the things that becomes very overwhelming for people is the number of Indigenous languages that we have in the Northwest Territories. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to what you would say to those people who find that that, that starting point is what is overwhelming to start with um, and, and how you would recommend, given your experience, um, you know, with, with our youth and with empowering uh, young language speakers, how you would uh, would tackle that. Thank you. I think the, the, there's three parts to this that, uh, that I see. First of all, is connecting. I think it's important that we connect with our languages and we don't feel so overwhelmed by it, but we, we, we thrive in it instead. And uh, when I look at it, we have to empower our young people to learn many languages. My grandfather, he knew five languages because of the necessities of, to survive back then. You know, we have to look at revitalization. What do we mean by revitalization? Is that we have to walk like two brothers or two sisters so that we can be successful in and, and preserving our language, protecting it and promoting it. And I don't think it's overwhelming. I think it's, it's an adventure. I think it's, it, it's fun learning the language. And, and I don't think we have to overwhelm ourselves. We have to make it fun so that uh, we can be creative. We can learn the language. You know, we have to make a living, a living dictionary of our, our classrooms. And that's what we do. And I think by, uh, by, by looking at that, you know, we have to connect, we have to empower, and we have to revitalize. Thank you, Mr. Boucher. Uh, any further questions from the committee? Emily O'Reilly, go ahead. Uh, Marcy, uh, Mr. Boucher, thanks very much for your uh, you know, your uh, talk there. Uh, one of the ideas that you mentioned was a, a declaration. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts as to uh, what it would say and sort of who would uh, sign on to it and lead it. Because uh, yeah, I think sometimes we just get overwhelmed with what we need to do. And I like the explanation you just gave to my colleague, uh, Emily Cleveland, but uh, this declaration, who, who would lead that and what kind of things would it say and um, what kind of power and authority would it, would it have? Marcy. Go ahead, Mr. Boucher. 
I think looking at a declaration is that is that it gives an effect and a recognition at the community level. Right now, I know that like the local governments, I know the First Nations and the Métis, they do a lot of work with, with languages through their coordinators. But then in order to coexist together, we need to find some kind of, um, something that will pull us together. And to be languages always pull people together. And if you recognize that, if you recognize Chippewa, Cree, Fort Smith, for example, along with the other languages that are recognized already, I think that'll bring the community closer. So it'll be a, a collaboration of, of, all, of all stakeholders in the community. That's what it would be. And from there, I think it'll, it'll uh, spring forward uh, more ideas It'll, it'll make the language more visible in the community. Thank you, Mr. Boucher. Are there any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, I would thank you very much. I, I have one more question for Mr. Boucher. I have one more question for Mr. Boucher. Go ahead. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I brought up it came to uh, these languages and one of the things I've asked uh, the minister a few times is why isn't uh, why aren't the indigenous uh, teachers paid the same as uh, as the French teacher because I believe that there's not uh, you're not on par with them and um, I just want you to speak to that because for me um, you know, my father was the same uh, part of the Acacia territory and of Chippewyan descent like yours, and my mother was also from descended from Fort Rez. Just, and I'm just wondering, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole statement of, uh, especially when we're 50 per, uh, over 50 percent Indigenous uh, people in the Northwest Territories by population, we're over we're over the 50 percent, and yet. You, as a, a, a teacher at the school, is not recognized by the department as the same as a French teacher. Could you speak to that, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, I think the important thing is that the uh, I'm, a, I'm a knowledge keeper, language keeper of our people. I learned the language and and the uh, traditions and the knowledge from the elders that I worked with for many, many years. To be their expert professors of life, of language, of, of culture. And that needs to be recognized. You know, right now, the, the, the amount of knowledge that I've accumulated is very important. And I teach a lot of that knowledge and language to the young people. And I think that should be in par with the universities. I believe that. Because the best knowledge that we have do come from our elders. You know, and uh, when I listened to my old dad before, and, and my mother and my grandfather, you know, I listened very carefully. And that's what shaped us today. So by recognizing, you know, the elders work on par of uh, of uh, our universities that are that are there. I think that's that's important, so that I, as myself, as a knowledge keeper, I'm paid the same. I see. Thank you, Mr. Wushe. Are there any further questions from the committee? Hearing none, just on behalf of the committee, we would once again like to thank you for presenting today and for all of your work that you do. Thank you very much, Mr. Boucher. Thank you. Our, our next presenter is uh, Ms. Wall. Ms. Wall, go ahead. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Tansay, Tawau, Kakiao, Iwiak, Nitika, San Jessica, Niotsi, Kaskawewin. Ota, um, Northwest Territories, uh, 
Neil Kiskawamaku Ota Kiskawamaku Kamek PWK High School. Nepiesta um, Mota Tipskaoma Kigwe Ikwa O Kiskawamaku. So today I come here as a mom and a teacher. Um, and I'm here because I am Cree, and in my culture, we have the medicine wheel, it's a circle, everything is uh, equal, nobody is above anybody, we all sit at the table the same. And um, this document doesn't show that to me. Um, this document shows me that I have English and French and I'm sitting away from the table. Uh, to me as a mother, this is concerning because I have worked hard with my children to reestablish um, Nihiyawin language in um, our lives. And it's concerning that um, this is a very westernized document. And I think that it needs to be decolonized and uh, everybody's voice needs to be included in this document. Um, you know, it needs to reflect everybody who is a language, um, official language speaker or learner, you know, like everybody needs to see themselves in this document and not sitting on the outside of it. Like, you know, it is frustrating as a speaker and a teacher to, you know, try to really push the language and then your students don't see that or your children, you know, they don't see the, the it being used. So that's disheartening, you know, where they'll even make comments like, well, what am I learning this for? Like nobody's uh, speaking it, you know, or so that is essential that that's on the phone, that they can hear that with these government services, because, you know, according to point five, it says, to the extent and in the manner provided in this act and any official language of the Northwest Territories have equality of status and equal rights and privilege as to their use in all government institutions. So I'm not seeing equality when I have two options to choose from of a language when there's more official languages. So I'd like to see more um, work in that area to like accommodate everybody and to really show the language or the richness of the language for everybody because they need to see value in learning and um, putting that effort in, you know, like um, I'm fortunate my students work hard. They're learning the language. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, OLC curriculum, you know, the government put out and it's, uh, it's a good step. It's a good first step, but my students really need to um, see and experience the, the language. And uh, it's not going to happen if it's constantly suppressed and put on a back burner. So um, they also need a voice in this document, uh, youth. And um, that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, it also says in the document they're uh, being committed to the preservation, development, and enhancement of the Aboriginal languages. So we really do need to see that, like, uh, it needs to have a real presence in the North, that we really embrace all these languages equally, you know. So um, that's what I had to share. And I did see that they wanted to re review these things every five years because it was concerning to me to see that there was like 11 or 12 year intervals where they reassessed this document. And I think that's kind of long. So I was happy to see that somebody put five years in there, but um, yeah, that's only my thing is we sit at the same table and we should all be seen equally. Thank you very much, Ms. Fall, for taking the time to present the committee tonight. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, I'll open the floor to any questions from members. Emily Cleveland, go ahead. The line is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much to Ms. Vall for your presentation, Mussy. Um, my and I 
One of the things that you touched on, which I think is so powerful because this document is largely silent in it, is you talked about how this document needs to represent everyone, even language learners. And this document doesn't speak um, really to developing language speakers. And if we have this document that says you have access you know, to a document in your language, but we're not doing the, the work to preserve language speakers across the territory, then we're not really, we're, we're so far down the road. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can speak to what you would like to see as a teacher and as a, as a parent, as far as um, action in this document to really preserve the rights of developing language speakers across the Northwest Territories. Thank you. Um, well, I don't know uh, what I can speak to, but it, with my profession, but um, I know the Dene Kade is a little outdated and there's huge ties that could go with the lang Indigenous languages. Um, the document pretty much lump sums all Native identity in under the Dene, but it is a chance that we could really establish a really nice website with like the Kinchon, the different languages and um, grow, like Mr. Boucher was saying, growing together. Like maybe we don't have these services now, but maybe we start, we start constructing them together, working together. So building up the language speakers at the same time as developing all these services, you know? Thank you, Ms. Wall. Uh, any further questions from the committee? Here, I would like to just... Go ahead, Emily Martin. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Jessica. Um, you know, um, being a teacher in uh, the Cree language, and uh, you were also uh, at our uh, at our caucus retreat last year when we first when we first got elected. And um, I remember uh, some of the uh, you know you were translating there and uh, did some of the things with um, the ECNE department, and I you know. I know that uh, you, um, you know, you said uh, the reflection of all languages should be equal, and I agree with you there. Um, but you feel that the document suppresses, uh, and you don't have a voice in the, in the do present document. Uh, so I want to know how we can, um, how would you like to see the document done? Like maybe uh, if you were able to do a written submission, maybe um, uh, to the to the committee, to the chair, and the mem and the committee members, on how you feel the document should be um, changed, so that you feel that you have a voice in this in this document, and that the equality thing is reflected in this document. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Paul. So how I, how I would see it reflected, um, I would say that with uh, the wording of French and English that we see all the other languages go hand in hand in the same line of the same document. Giving it the same weight as those two languages. If they are indeed official languages, they should be given the same respect and weight. Thank you, Ms. Wall. Are there any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, on behalf of the committee, of all, we'd just like to thank you for taking the time to present and uh, thank you for all of the work that you do and to all of our presenters tonight and anyone who joined us live uh, on the various legislative assembly pages, we would like to thank you. And uh, hopefully this is the first of many meetings and much of the work to update our Official Languages Act and, and bring forward the comments that we heard tonight. Uh, with that, I will move to adjourn this public hearing and just once again, thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.